Hello and welcome everyone to the 91st episode of the RSM COVID webinar series. It's lovely to have you joining us this afternoon. I am Claire Bainton, I'm Clinical Consultant in Global Public Health and Vice President of the Royal Society of Medicine. And it's my pleasure today to welcome Jeremy Hunt to join us for our session today. He is and was the longest serving uh, Secretary of State for Health uh, for the UK um, for the years of 2012 to 2018. And he is the current chair of the Health and Social Care Committee responsible for scrutinizing the work of the Department of Health and Social Care and all our associated bodies. Earlier this month on the 12th of October, the committee working jointly with the Science and Technology Committee published the report, Coronavirus Lessons Learned to Date. And that will be the focus of our discussion today. Welcome, Jeremy. Hi, Claire. So I would like to start today with two quotations. The first is drawn from the executive summary from your own report. It reads, decisions on lockdowns and social distancing during the early weeks of the pandemic and the advice that led to them rank as one of the most important public health failures the United Kingdom has ever experienced. This happened despite the UK counting on some of the best expertise available anywhere in the world, and despite having an open, democratic system that allows plentiful challenge. Painful though it is, the UK must learn lessons, anything that it can of why this has happened, if we are to ensure it is not repeated. And there was a response published in the BMJ by Cameron Abbasi. It is titled COVID-19, Fatal Errors, Not Fatalism, Created the UK's Public Health Disaster. And he writes, fatalism is the awkward conclusion of the joint inquiry into the UK's pandemic response. These were calamitous pandemic failures. The human and economic disaster of COVID-19 should not be shrugged off as scientific and political fatalism. I would like to discuss some of the key issues raised from this report, borrowing from components of the emergency, mer uh, emergency management cycle as we do this, to sort of fit, if you like, with uh, the crisis that we have faced. And I'm going to twist to a twist on that and start with preparedness as part of uh, the chronology of your role coming from your position previously as Secretary of State. So we have had questions from Jonathan Power, Adin, Adib Ahmed, Nikki Jis and Peter Carter, all related to the pandemic preparedness question. The report concludes that the UK's pandemic planning was too narrowly and inflexibly based on a flu model, which failed to learn the lessons of Ebola, SARS and MERS. The result was that whilst our pandemic planning has been globally acclaimed, it performed less well than other countries when it was needed most. Jeremy, on reflection, is there anything you wish you had done differently during your time as Health Secretary? Well, many things, Claire, and, and thank you for inviting me for a very, very important discussion. And uh, the first thing I'd say is that I absolutely do not, and this report does not shrug off the political and scientific failures as fatalism. Uh, we try to understand those failures, what led to them. Uh, and the reason we want to understand that is because the next time we have a pandemic, it's uh, quite possible we will have a different health secretary, a different prime minister, different scientific advisors. And we need to understand what went wrong in our systems. But I think it's also important just for balance to say that we also say in the report that the vaccine programme was one of the biggest successes in British public administration. And so you have this extraordinary contrast where you have some very serious failures and some enormous successes, often with the very same people responsible for both. And I think it's important to, to get that balance in there, but I don't also shrug off my role. I was health secretary from 2012 to 2018, as you say, and, uh, in that period, we did a lot of work on pandemic preparedness. We thought we were one of the best in the world. Johns Hopkins University in America said we were the second best prepared country in the world. And the fact is we weren't. 
and um, there was a group think, uh, which I was part too when I was health secretary, that basically said if we're going to have a pandemic in this country, the most likely pandemic we have we're going to have is, is pandemic flu. And so the bulk of our effort went into preparing for pandemic flu. Um, Operation Cygnus, which was a huge three-day exercise that I oversaw, um, was in retrospect flawed because first of all, it, it only looked at what you do when a flu pandemic is already established, not what you can do to stop it getting established, but also it was very focused on flu. Um, so testing is not mentioned at any stage at all in terms of the lessons learned from that exercise. So absolutely, I was part of that group. I think I've always been completely open about that. Um, and we need to put in place structures to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Just referring to your report on the group think, one of the things you actually raised is about uh, the lack of looking internationally at what was going on elsewhere. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, and I think um, this is something you'll be very aware of with your um, international expertise, Claire, but what is very striking if you look back at the events of last January, February and March is how little attention we paid to what was happening in South Korea and Taiwan, which were the two places that had the best pandemic response of anywhere in the world in the first year. They actually ran into difficulties this year, but in that first year, in terms of the number of deaths and the control of the virus, they did better than anywhere else. And we didn't decide to go South Korean in our response to the pandemic until, uh, well, Test and Trace was set up, I think at the beginning of May and got going at the end of May, uh, by the time it got going, we had five, we were having 5,000 new infections every day, which was a much higher number than the South Korean test and trace system ever had to cope with. And that delay proved to be fatal and that cost a lot of lives. And so one of the things that we recommend in the report is that SAGE's advice to ministers in a pandemic, I'm not saying this in normal times, but in a pandemic, should be made public immediately so that it can be effectively peer reviewed by all the brilliant scientists we have up and down the country. I think if we'd done that last January, then we'd have had a lot of people saying, um, why aren't we looking at what's happening in South Korea and Taiwan? And we would have got to the right place more quickly. Yes, thank you. We have a question from Camilo um, Kolaku and Ken Ng. Comparing the vaccine rollout to test and trace, is there a clear lesson about public versus private for healthcare profession and how this relates to value for money? Very topical with the news today of the 37 billion spent on test and trace. Um, I don't share that analysis. I, I understand why lots of people have said that. But I mean, the first thing to say is that the vaccine rollout, the success of the vaccine rollout was very closely linked to very, very tight collaboration between the public and private sector, in particular between the, the scientists at the MI, MHRA who were approving the vaccines for safety and the pharmaceutical companies. And that close relationship in which I think the MRA, MHRA did better than any regulator anywhere in the world. We were the first country to approve and start distributing uh, vaccines was because of that very close public-private collaboration. In terms of test and trace, I do think one of the lessons we'll learn is that, we need to learn, is that block contracts and a centralised delivery model is not the most effective way of scaling up test and trace in a pandemic. And we have a network of laboratories run by hospitals and universities. Um, and uh, we would have been better to tap into those earlier. But in truth, by the time we got to set up test and trace, community transmission was at such a high level that it was very difficult to see any other way of doing it than the lighthouse laboratories and those big contracts. I think if we'd started doing it earlier, we could have made much better use of smaller laboratories. And I think for sure, 
uh, the tracing element of test and trace is better led by local authorities. I think that one of the big challenges we found in our test and trace program was compliance. We had large periods last year when between 25 and 40% of the people who are being asked to isolate weren't isolating. And there are many reasons for that. But I think one of them is that if you're called by someone from a call center 300 miles away, you're less likely to comply with an isolation request than if you're called by your local authority. So that's another really important lesson that we draw. Yes, and speaking from a public health perspective, I was in contact with directors of public health at the time who really felt that they weren't getting the information they need and their expertise were not used. And in fact, your report acknowledges this, and I quote, the capabilities of local directors of public health and their teams were not effectively harnessed. It is now clear that the optimal structure for test and trace is one that is locally driven with the ability to draw on central surge capacity, but it took the best part of the year to get to that point. I Why think that's a really you... important point, Claire, because you do need that central surge capacity in a pandemic, because if you suddenly have an outbreak in, I don't know, uh, Blackburn, and you decide you want to test everyone in the whole city, then um, it's unlikely that the local council will have that capability to hand right away. So you do want to have that surge capacity. But what you want, I think, is uh, for the core capacity to be locally driven and locally led. What I'd like to talk about now is the prevention. So the vaccines that you've spoken about and the booster in particular has been delayed in its rollout. What's going on there? Well, it's very difficult to judge what is happening right now. Um, and, you know, I'm not a, a doctor like you and not, certainly not an epidemiologist, but looking at the evidence that's been published, it seems to me that the the growth in cases that we are currently experiencing, we're hoping it's beginning to wane a bit, has principally happened in uh, teenage school children. And so we, I think, have been more exposed because countries like France that were behind us uh, in terms of the vaccine rollout, by the time we got to the start of the school term this autumn, they had vaccinated, I think, two thirds of their school children, we were a long way, we were less than a third. They've gone for double vaccination and we are only doing one jab. And so I think the, the delay in the booster program and the school children vaccination program is the heart of why we're seeing um, a mini surge at the moment. And that's where I think we need to focus our efforts to turn things around. Um, but obviously things like masks, vaccine passports and so on have a role to play, but I don't think that is the heart of why we're in the situation we're in. So we've had questions related to plan B and whether we are going to be implementing that now. What thoughts do you have on that? Well, I think we need to be prepared to move to different uh, ways to tackle the virus. I've, I've always said that in a pandemic, um, you should welcome a government that changes its mind, uh, not castigate them for doing a U-turn. Um, I think it's also true to say that one of the clear lessons in our report is that it's always better to act earlier and more decisively than you perhaps want to. Um, but I think in this situation, you know, the lesson I'm drawing is that essentially what we need to turbocharge is the vaccine uh, rollout, particularly the booster jabs, uh, and the, uh, the children's vaccine program, because that is, I think, at the heart of what's driving the increased case rates. I just want to quote from the BMA from the 25th of this week, um, who have said uh, they've accused the government of willfully neglect, sorry, of willfully neglecting, uh, oh, sorry, my apologies, willfully negligent for not reimposing rules such as mandatory face masks. Yeah, I think, that is harsh because I don't think the government is, you know, willfully neglecting anything. Um, but I wish that we had started earlier with the booster program. I wish we'd started earlier with the, uh, the teenage vaccination program. I, I, I do think in retrospect, we should have been doing more of that in the summer. I understand why we weren't, which is that ministers were waiting for a JCBI decision 
And when it comes to vaccinating children, it, it is very, very important that you have uh, scientists saying this is the right thing to happen because you know people are not going to believe politicians when it comes. Well, they're not going to believe politicians when it comes to a vaccination program. Full stop. But they, particularly when it comes to children, that's a very sensitive issue. But I do think that turbocharging that vaccination program is is now the most important thing that needs to happen. But you know, and would I be sympathetic to saying we need to be wearing masks more often? Absolutely. I don't think there's any real cost to doing that, but I don't think that's the most important thing. Thank you. And when you're talking about delays, and I'm afraid I'm jumping back chronology um, here, we have had questions from Malcolm Barrett Johnson, Sean Scarhill and others asking specifically about the delay to the first lockdown. And they are saying that they believe that the medical and scientific community were not listened to by government decision makers. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we looked into this very closely and um, we concluded, and I think the evidence from SAGE and the minutes from SAGE bear this out, that in that first lockdown, ministers were following scientific advice. Um, the scientific advice at the time was, was very preoccupied with uh, two things that I think turned out to be wrong. And I'm saying this absolutely with the benefit of hindsight because you know, you need to learn uh, by looking back at what happened, but there was an assumption that people wouldn't accept lockdown for longer than a short period. So if you lock down too early, there was a risk that people would stop uh, following social distancing rules uh, right at the moment the pandemic was peaking. And there was another belief that once there was community transmission, um, it wasn't so important to have a lot of testing. And so the advice to ramp up the testing as happened in Taiwan and South Korea wasn't given until too late. And that's because I think there was this flu paradigm in people's minds. Uh, and in flu pandemics, you do stop testing once you get to the stage of community transmission. Um, but I don't think that exonerates the politicians. Um, the politicians should have challenged that scientific advice and that challenge didn't happen. And I think that's why, um, and, I, and by the way, I don't think that exonerates people like me because as I say, I was also part of that group think, although it was a couple of years earlier, um, there was that group think, um, and we need to recognize that um, going forward, we need to be much more open to the possibility of pandemics from viruses that we haven't yet been affected by, um, you know, the countries that had experience of SARS and MERS uh, had a better response than the countries that had been previously affected by pandemic flu. And that's one of the big lessons that we definitely need to learn. Uh, I have a question here, and it, it's raised by um, Cameron Abbasi in regard to the disbanding of PHE um, during uh, the pandemic. And was this related to the test and trace uh, issues? I don't know, um, but um, I had a high opinion of PHE when I was health secretary and our report does not conclude that the major mistakes in the pandemic were made by PHE. Um, and I think that uh, we need to be really careful with the new structures that we've got. Um, it, for sure, we need a much beefed up uh, function or body that is horizon scanning for new pandemics, a bit like the, I think the Robert Koch Institute does in Germany. And so I think it's the right thing that we have a body that is very focused on that. But if we are going to address an issue that I know is very close to your heart, which is health inequalities, then um, we, which, you know, have very much come to the fore during the pandemic, um, in particular, the, you know, the very shocking, totally unacceptable 19 year gap in healthy life expectancy between the richest and the poorest in our society, then we're going to need to have very effective campaigns on things like obesity. And that is something where PHE had a, a very important role, and I think did a pretty good job overall. So I'm want to be very careful to make sure with the new structures we have, we don't lose some of that very important work that PHE was doing.
Yes, thank you. And in fact, um, we have a quote here from uh, the BMJ article in regard to this term fatalism. Did fatalism kill people in social care or differentially target people who are disadvantaged? Was it fatalism that denied frontline health and social care professionals adequate uh, protective, personal protective equipment during the pandemic? And of course he concludes no. A query also from Ali Asar, one of our audience members is, um, about the lack of available PPE to NHS staff who subsequently died from COVID or are unwell, and of course to raise the issue of social care homes and their access to PPE. Okay, well some really important issues. So let's be very clear. Um, we use the word fatalism in that report, but that is not our explanation for all the policy errors that happened in our initial response. So we, we use the word fatalism to talk about the, uh, the belief, the group think, if you like, that it was inevitable that COVID was gonna spread through the entire population with you know, potentially 60% of the population getting it, um, which I think was partly because there was a sort of uh, a residual flu mindset. Uh, even though countries like South Korea and Taiwan were keeping the spread of the virus to less than 1% of the population. So, so fatalism is part of our explanation for why that early scientific advice was wrong. But then there were other mistakes that were nothing to do with fatalism. They were serious policy errors. Now, PPE, um, there were some early delays in getting PPE out to hospitals, but the... The government says, and I accept that this was not that we didn't have the PPE, it was a distribution issue. Um, and they were sorted out relatively quickly, but in those very early days, they were very serious. And uh, there were, you know, there were sadly doctors and nurses who lost their lives because they didn't have adequate protection quickly enough. Um, and I think there's a big issue in hospitals about being quicker to, uh, understand the risks of nosocomial infection. What I think happened was that we were very hot on nosocomial infection, the risk of nosocomial infection in intensive care units and COVID wards, but we were less vigilant about it in other parts of hospitals and particularly the risk of the virus spreading asymptomatically in, in hospital canteens and cafes and the non-COVID parts of hospitals. And I think that in a future pandemic, I'm sure the NHS will send out guidance on that more quickly uh, than happened this time. But the real uh, tragedy with PPE was what happened in the social care sector. Because the NHS is a, a very big buyer, a monopoly buyer of PPE, when the NHS decided it needed more PPE, it effectively crowded the social care system out of the market. And so care home providers found they were unable to access PPE for love nor money. There was a global shortage. They were desperately going onto Amazon trying to see if they could source PPE from anywhere. And we absolutely need to have more resilience when it comes to PPE supply for the care home sector. In Hong Kong, uh, one of the things they learned from uh, SARS and MERS was uh, that care homes needed to have a three month supply of PPE the whole time. And uh, that is, and they, had, they managed to have zero deaths and zero infections in Hong Kong care homes. They did completely seal them off. So that was very, very tough for residents of those care homes, you know, including people with dementia and so on. But uh, in terms of COVID fatalities, they did much better than I think anywhere else in the world. Um, there were other issues with the social care sector as well. I think that we defaulted to um, what happens too often. Indeed, you know, I want to be clear, including in my time as health secretary, where when there's a crisis, attention switches to what's happening in hospitals. Uh, the, the crisis in last spring was uh, really focused by what was happening in Lombardy and hospitals in Northern Italy and in New York. And so there was a lot of attention focused on how we prepare hospitals for a potential wave of COVID patients and a lot of focus on ICU beds and ventilators. And uh, we didn't have the equivalent focus on the social care sector. So as we uh, 
we all said for many years that the social care sector should be treated equally to the NHS. Um, everyone wants to do that. Everyone tries to do that. In a crisis, that didn't happen. And so that's why we need to put in place structures to make sure that that commitment to the social care sector happens even when our backs are against the wall in a crisis. I just want to raise from your own report a specific group that we haven't touched on in, in that answer there, which was um, which was thorough and helpful, but uh, is those individuals with uh, learning disabilities uh, and autism. So I'm quoting from the report the dispro disproportionately high mortality rates that people with learning disabilities and autistic people have suffered throughout the pandemic has highlighted the health inequalities experienced by this group. Health conditions were compounded by inadequate access to the care people with learning disabilities needed at a time of crisis. And also you raised the need for them to have an advocate with them for them to get the care that they need. We've had an ear, a message uh, question from Sheila Hollins who asks, how well were people with learning disabilities protected by the government's response? Well, I'm afraid this is a, a part of the broader challenge of health inequalities that has been brought to light by the pandemic. Um, and uh, the fatality rates of people from minority ethnic backgrounds were higher. The fatality rates of people with learning disabilities were higher. And even before the pandemic, um, this is something where we need to do much, much better as a society on. Um, and we published a report on the select committee uh, about precisely that issue. Um, I think the practical thing that we got wrong in the pandemic was um, understanding that when you give a blanket instruction, for example, no visitors to care homes, um, how there are going to be particular situations where that is going to be immensely damaging to residents who may not understand why that's happened. Um, and I think that's why we talk about the need for advocates for people with learning disabilities and the ability to be more flexible. There are people uh, with severe autism and learning disabilities for whom in an individual case, it may have been better to allow them to have a visitor from outside than to see them cut off from all external visitors for three months, six months, nine months. Um, but I actually think there is a broader issue here, Claire, which is that uh, in terms of our policy in general, uh, we are putting too many people with learning disabilities and, and autism in secure locked units because it's the only place left for them to go. That can often massively exacerbate any mental health issues that they already might have. Um, when they would be much better looked after in the community. I'm a big fan of the Trieste model of care that's used in Italy, where they've banned long-term admissions of people with uh, uh, learning disabilities and autism into uh, residential care and created adequate community provision, which uh, we have not done here. And I think that is a much more humane way, it's a much happier way, much better for staff as well. Um, and that's, again, a really important long term lesson we need to learn. And that is fascinating to hear your sort of long term views on, on these issues. But just looking a bit closer to home in terms of vaccine being compulsory for health and social care staff. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I um, think it is a responsibility for health and care staff to do everything they can to make sure that they don't in fact, a patient, and when you have a disease that can be transmitted asymptomatically and you are in a job where you're going to be in contact with those patients the whole time, uh, then I do think you have a responsibility to get a vaccine. And so I didn't have this dilemma when I was a health secretary, but we, we did look at the same issue when it came to flu jabs. And I do think that the health and care staff do have a responsibility to to make sure that they are protecting their patients. And I think that's something that the vast majority understand. Can I move now to uh, sort of the, the international situation with vaccines? So from the, the, the micro of individuals having it within our own health system, uh, moving up to the 
the question of Gideon Malawa actually will, will place this nicely, which is what are the global North countries doing to make sure the global South countries are not left behind in COVID-19 vaccination? I, I just actually, I'll just fill that out a bit with what's just come out uh, from the IMF, International Monetary Fund. It's recently cut its growth forecast for the world economy. They specifically cite a global economic loss of $5.3 trillion over the next five years, unless vaccine coverage gaps are closed. At the G7 summit in June, wealthy nations made only modest commitments to redistribute vaccines. And the recent UN General Assembly vaccine summit really agreed only targets to scale up coverage over the next year. We have the G20 summit starting, uh, well, it's just about to start, the 30th to the 31st of October. And uh, the query is, is will this forum agree a global strategy to achieve universal COVID-19 vaccine coverage in 2022? Well, to answer your question, uh, is the rich world doing enough? Um, the answer is no. And um, I think it's been a glaring gap in, um, in our global response to the pandemic that we have not seen uh, wealthier countries come together and put in place a plan that means that every single person across the world who needs a vaccine gets one quickly. Um, and there are all sorts of uh, reasons why that's the case. I think the, uh, the geostrategic tensions between America and China haven't helped, but um, you, know, you know better than me as a public health expert that uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe because of, not least because of the risk of variants. Um, so yes, I really hope the G20 summit in Rome uh, bites the bullet on this, but um, you know, it, it really needs President Biden, Boris Johnson, uh, Emmanuel Macron, Angela Merkel, um, global leaders to come together and uh, really bite the bullet on this. Um, I was, you know, there was, I think, one bit of good news in the budget yesterday, which is the, that Rishi Sunak said that uh, we are intending to get back to giving 0.7% of our GDP to uh, international aid by the end of this parliament. I was against the cut in that aid. Um, but uh, I feel that we, this is something that is really badly missing from our international response. And I, I felt the need, as you saw, to quote the IMF to demonstrate the point, but I'm pleased that you are also saying there's the ethical, moral and the health uh, strength that we are not, uh, not uh, secure until everyone is. Uh, I would like to now move on to the impact of the report. We've got a number of questions around this. Uh, Ondine Sherwood, David Boniface, to Tom Hampton, Nicholas Gibbons, Rebecca Hobbs, thank you all for your question. And they all relate around this. What can be done to ensure that the health policy makers learn from the mistakes highlighted in your report rather than repeat them? Well, um, I think it's really important to adopt our recommendations. I'm sorry to be so sort of uh, self-serving in a way in saying that, but we, we make some really practical recommendations in that report that are not uh, gonna be cheap to implement. Some of them are, you know, the, the advice from SAGE should be published immediately during a pandemic so that we can make sure that all the great minds around the country are applying themselves to the, the problems we face. But we say, for example, that local authorities should have the capability to stand up test and trace capability within one or two weeks for any future pandemic. Um, that is really, really important because it was the delay in setting up test and trace capability that was uh, one of the biggest reasons why the pandemic got a hold here uh, that it needn't have done. Um, we also talk about the need for a long-term plan for the social care sector because there was a lack of resilience in that sector. Um, we, we talk about the fact that the, the NHS, I think, did incredibly well in the pandemic. If you look at the, the narrow question of, did we find ventilators for everyone who needed them? Did we find hospital beds, ICU beds for everyone with COVID who, who needed it? Broadly, the answer to that is yes. The price we paid for that though, particularly in the first lockdown, was stopping nearly all other 
NHS care. And so last year we had 45,000 fewer people starting cancer treatment, for example. And you know, lives will be lost as a result of that. So a big lesson for the NHS is to make sure that we have uh, the capability to treat cancer in clean or green zones uh, that can continue uninterrupted if we have um, a future lockdown in a future pandemic. So there are some really important lessons that, that we need to learn in terms of our resilience for pandemics. Um, apart from the, the obvious ones about making decisions more quickly, closing borders more quickly, uh, making decisions on lockdown more quickly, um, some structural ones that are incredibly important. And I want to just extend that planning that you're talking about and resourcing for pandemics uh, to AMR, um, antimicrobial uh, resistance. Does the UK have, a, this is a question from Crispin Wickfield, does the UK have a plan for tackling a multi-drug resistant bacteria outbreak that really could bring the healthcare to our needs? Well, I was really privileged to work closely with Sally Davis um, as Chief Medical Officer in my time who is the leading global champion of further action on this. And um, I think you can be glass half empty and glass half full. Um, you know, glass half empty, um, we have still not created the financial incentives for pharmaceutical companies to develop the new generation of antibiotics that we need to make sure that AMR doesn't become the world's biggest killer by 2050. I mean, we're, we're all talking about stopping uh, the climate increasing in temperature by one and a half degrees by then. But actually, we also know that if we don't crack this problem, uh, AMR will be a bigger killer than cancer by the middle of the century. So it's a massive issue. Glass half full, and I think we should, um, you know, you've asked me some tough questions. Can I, can I talk about some slightly more positive things, Claire, for a moment, because it relates yes, to AMR. Welcome. I mean, what do I hope will be the biggest single thing that emerges as a positive from this horrific pandemic. I think we have all understood the power of science to transform our response to global health catastrophes in a way we didn't before. And, um, you know, the, at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't have a treatment, didn't have a test, uh, we didn't have a vaccine, and we never developed a vaccine uh, as quickly as we ended up doing. And uh, the NHS, and particularly the recovery trial, the discovery of dexamethasone as a treatment, probably saved about a million lives worldwide. I think that has brought home to us that when we're trying to do the things that I wrestled with as health secretary, and I'm now looking at, for example, on the health celebrity, how do we get our cancer survival rates to be as good as, as cancer survival rates in Denmark or, or Australia? Uh, we don't just want to look at how other countries do things and, and follow best practice, although we should definitely do that. Let's think about what innovation can do. What are the discoveries that we're on the cusp of making? And I think that people do feel excitement about that. And there's a willingness to invest in that. And we heard the Chancellor talking about that yesterday in his budget speech. Um, and so I think some excitement about the potential for science um, not just to mean that we, we live longer, but to stop catastrophes, meaning that we live for a shorter period of time um, is something that we can take away. And that's what I think needs to happen with AMR. Yeah, thank you for that. And, it, and it's good of you to also, you brought into your answer earlier about the, the COP um, climate uh, conference that's ongoing. Uh, and also you've recognized um, the importance of science. It reminds me of a conversation I've just had with uh, Professor Hugh Montgomery of Intensive Care, which is that really we need to turn off the tap to the NHS. And that will be the way to resolve some of these issues. And that can be done by combining some of these planetary health imperatives uh, with the public health and doing that through innovation, as you're saying, and science to support that process so that we get better diets, better active and public transport, management of air and other polluters, managing some of these issues uh, from that perspective is going to make the difference. With his insight being that 14 out of 15 of his patients in intensive care wouldn't have been there if we'd managed these things upstream uh, from a sort of public health um, investment perspective. Yes, I, 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 would, I would not say we should turn off the tap to the NHS because I think um, with an aging population, there is going to be a, a growing need for 
more treatment and we're going to need more hospital beds. Um, but he is absolutely right. Uh, I think the figure that uh, Sally Davis uses is that only 15% of our health is accounted for by the health care we receive. 85% of it is, is the, uh, the, the choices we make about how to live our lives. And that's where the prevention agenda can be important and needs to be much, much more important. I just want to clarify, he wasn't saying, saying turn off the tap in the way you've interpreted my, my mistake. It's uh, turn off the need and the demand. So stop. Oh, oh well, then well I completely agree. The yeah. uh, I also just wanted to bring to you um, the issue that we've got Sally joining us for a, a webinar on AMR um, coming up for our audience. You might be used to uh, interested in that coming later in November. Um, so I just want to also raise what you've been talking about lately, which is about the need that money is not necessarily just the answer. It is staffing uh, that we need, recruitment and training. Would you like to share some of your thoughts on that with our audience? Yes, I mean, I'm really worried that um, history is gonna repeat itself and we're going to, to make some of the mistakes that we've made in the past on this respect. It, if there was one thing I wish I'd known at the start of my time as health secretary, which I came to realize in the middle of my time is that although when you're doing that incredibly challenging job, the system is geared to tell you, uh, Secretary of State, if you want better cancer care, if you want to avoid another mid staffs, give us more money and uh, we'll sort it out. Um, and that's the message that you get loud and clear as a, as a minister. Um, if you don't have the workforce to go alongside the extra money, uh, then you, you don't get the results you want. So if you give the NHS five billion pounds a year extra, but you haven't got five billion pounds worth of additional doctors and nurses, uh, what you are most likely to do is to inflate the pay that goes to locum doctors and agency nurses. And you may improve the specific area of care that you're focusing on as a minister where you perhaps have a target, uh, but it might be at the expense of diverting it from other parts of the system. And I think we have uh, failed to train enough doctors and nurses for many years now. Uh, in 2016, I announced a 25% increase in the number of doctors, nurses, midwives that we train um, and five new medical schools uh, because I was worried about this. Um, but I think in truth, we need to get some science behind this. And um, I look at the the discipline that the Office for Budget Responsibility now exerts on chancellors with their forecasts of budgets. So if you remember about 15 years ago, we used to have a debate about chancellors fiddling the books uh, or fiddling their forecasts to suit a political narrative. We don't now do that with the OBR because the forecasts are independent of the Treasury. And I think we should make Health Education England independent. It should have a statutory duty to make independent forecasts of the number of doctors, nurses, midwives, AHPs, and every specialty that we're gonna need in the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. Therefore, how many we need to be training now. It's then a political decision as to whether to fund that training, but we need to inject that honesty into the system because uh, you know, worldwide we have a shortage of 2 million doctors, uh, 15 million nurses, according to the WHO. Uh, we're not going to be able to solve this problem through immigration. And although foreign-born doctors do a fantastic job for the NHS, it is not ethical to depend on doctors coming from developing countries to supply the gaps in the NHS because we haven't been training enough here in the UK. So I think we need to address that issue as a matter of urgency. And I'm trying to persuade the government at the moment to amend the health bill that's going through Parliament to make HE independent, supported by all the Royal Colleges, all the health think tanks, uh, NHS providers, uh, and every 50 health bodies. Uh, so, you know, fingers crossed we can do that because I think it's, we need that overhaul of our approach to workforce training. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and thank you for your work in pushing that forward. Uh, just for the benefit of our audience and figures, we have 5.7 million people on waiting lists in the NHS at the moment, which includes 6,000 who have been waiting for more than two years. Uh, and the Health Foundation has recently estimated that we need 
4,000 more doctors and 17,000 more nurses to clear that backlog. Jeremy, I'm going to need to wrap up now. It's been a pleasure having you. If you could just bear with me whilst I give a couple of specific announcements. Our next COVID series episode will be on the 11th of November with Professor Maggie Ray, President of the Faculty of Public Health, and she'll be interviewing Tim Spector, Professor of Genetic Epidemiology, and indeed leader of the world's largest ongoing study of COVID-19. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have a spotlight series on AMR. That's on the 23rd of November with Professor Sally Davis, uh, as highlighted there uh, by Jeremy. She is the UK Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance. And Keith Ridge, from the Chief Pharmaceutical who is the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer at NHS England. Jeremy, thank you so much for your time and your insights and for the benefit of our audience. We've heard uh, great, great depths and from your perspectives on what uh, you have experienced in leading on the inquiry uh, or the report, the inquiry yet to come. To our audience, thank you very much for joining us. It is, uh, it is important to have you with us and to learn uh, these insights. And please, for those who are interested and able, we would welcome donations to keep this uh, series going and to support our work at the RSM. And I would also like to start support and uh, thank our staff at the RSM who are behind making this series possible. So Jeremy, thanks again for your time, for your insights, and may I wish everyone a good afternoon, a good evening, a good morning, wherever it is that you're joining us from. Take care. Thanks very much, Claire. Bye-bye.